Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for uh, the first webinar series uh, installment of the new year of 2021 with Joe Schmidt, uh, when he's, he will be talking about distilling history and the benefits of simplicity in the art of historical game design. Joe is a game designer who recently published The Landing uh, Gallipoli, uh, if you're interested. Uh, and I hand it over to you, Joe. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sebastian. And hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for taking the time to chat with me about this. Uh, I've, I've been really excited uh, to talk about it. War games and history are, are some of my favorite things. So uh, let's get going. Oh, I'm oh, sorry about that. My sister is cool. Um, all right. So about me. Let's talk a little bit about myself. Um, I was born in New Jersey, um, which uh, I think for me, the biggest thing growing up was the connection to history that you get from uh, being there, kind of this crossroads of the revolution and everything. So, you know, I, I was uh, from uh, right outside of Princeton, so close to kind of Princeton University and all the history there, um, close to Philadelphia, used to go on field trips to all of the, those places. I have a good friend who works at the old barracks in Trenton, um, and then of course all the battlefields for the Revolutionary War, and then the Civil War, um, going to Gettysburg and Antietam Tatum and Chancellorsville, and then as a, as a kid uh, to Colonial Williamsburg and places like that. It just felt like, for me, it was the best possible place to be born because I was surrounded by all of this incredible history that was very uh, tactile for me. I felt like I could experience it in a really, really cool way, um, which kind of feeds on to the picture over there of the old barracks. The thing that really drove me as a kid was that connection to uh, living history. So going to places like the old barracks, going to Colonial Williamsburg, I don't know how many of you have been to either of those places. If you haven't, they're worth a visit. Another great one is Fort Ticonderoga up in New York State. Uh, but I still have these vivid memories as a kid of going over the holidays and all the beautiful garlands and everybody dressed in their appropriate attire and the, the taste of the gingerbread cookies and the hot cider and standing outside of the courthouse in Williamsburg and just feeling like I was there. You know, and like you, you read Johnny Tremaine as a kid, you do all these things and that connection really stuck with me as an adult. Uh, and I always wanted to find ways that I could connect to history in a similar way. Uh, Wargaming was a big way that I did that. Uh, I'm a historical miniatures wargamer, also a board wargamer, uh, played a variety of different kind of miniature wargames, but some of the ones I really loved were DBA. Um, growing up, I loved the simplicity of that system and the way you could do those things. Uh, it was uh, really exciting and painting and finding the uniforms and then going to conventions, Historicon, uh, which was in Lancaster, but it's moved around quite a bit. I haven't been in some time, but was always one of my favorites because you could go and you could experience these huge battlefields set up in miniature and really see the battles and move the pieces and think about why things happened the way they happened or, or what was driving it. It was, it was really uh, incredible. And then uh, my family. I have two daughters. Uh, they're twins. They're seven now. And my wife is a photographer. Uh, we have a dog as well. You'll see a picture of Rugby later. Um, I'm really driven by my family. Uh, my family is the most important thing to me and the way I think about the games I play and, and the, the, the space I use up and, and all of that is, has driven a lot about uh, my design aesthetic and kind of the games that I want to create. Great. Um, so just to start off, uh, the definition of war game can be a very finicky thing, but I saw this the other day from Tom and Mary Russell, and I'm going to stick with this when I talk about war games. Um, if we want to talk about this or converse about this, we can uh, uh, after, uh, because I think that this is a really interesting conversation. But for now, when I talk about a war game, I mean games that attempt to engage seriously with or to model some aspect of history in some way. Why historical war games? 
you know, this is a this is still like contentious in some regards um, because of the fact that it's a war game. But I, I really see an incredible benefit, not just beyond kind of the fun of it, but the history. I'll go into that. So you have the emotion, the emotional nature of conflict is rooted in all of human history. It, it's something that every culture has experienced, that humans still experience to this day. It, it's it's really something that kind of uh, binds our experiences together. Uh, and it allows us to understand and see kind of the most like extreme versions of, of, of human history. Then you have strategy. Uh, you have the puzzle-like nature of games that creates an immersive experience. Uh, one of the reasons that we play these games is because uh, we want to kind of scratch that itch. We want to solve the puzzle. We want to figure out how to win. We want to plan the right strategy. If we're replaying a battle like Gettysburg, we want to see if there was a way that it could have been fought differently, if there could have been a different outcome, and, and how that could have happened based on our reading or experience, things like that. And then education. A knowledge of our shared history is key to better understanding. So by playing and working through these games, we find out really incredible ways that we can learn and get that kind of living history, that impact, even if it's not in a place like the Colonial Williamsburg or the old barracks that it's at our kitchen table or at the local game club that we can experience those things. So the emotional nature of conflict. Um, diplomacy is probably my favorite game ever. I really love it, uh, and I think that it, I, I love it for a lot of reasons. I, it is an abstract uh, historical game, but the thing that I really love about it is the fact that it draws emotions out of people, and that I started playing it when I was a teenager via play-by-email. I think it was called DipHub or something like that uh, was the website that I used to go through to play, and I, I just really love the game, and I love the fact that you could elicit these emotions from a game and that you could connect to these things and that you could feel anger and joy and like sadness and resentment, a lot of resentment with diplomacy. Uh, but it's just a really fascinating game and, and the way that it captures that and then the way that kind of all games have the ability to capture that. And then of course, dice. We've all been on the good side and the bad side of dice rolls. Um, and I think that they also capture that kind of toss up uh, concept of these battles and these things that we're encountering or dealing with uh, in history. Uh, so the chance aspect of things. Next we have the different strategic choices that you can make. I just finished a game of Cataclysm uh, that was really fascinating where I played as the German player and I, I tried to play it as a pacifist which was kind of an interesting exercise for me and I think that with the with a game like Cataclysm that opens up in a sandbox way, the opportunity for all these different strategies, you can think about how you would do these things. You can scratch that itch and kind of work on those puzzles in that way uh, to really kind of figure those things out and figure out, all right, well, why did the allies do this? Or why did the Axis do that? And kind of put you in that seat to help you better understand. And then a game like Sekigahara, which is uh, another one, one of my favorites, uh, the ability to make these choices and the hidden nature of it and the use of the cards. It, it's really an incredible system. And then a better understanding of history. Here we have uh, Cuba Libre and uh, Twilight Struggle. Um, these games are really good at teaching us this history and, and, and helping impart kind of the whys uh, that when you're playing Cuba Libre and these cards come up, you can refer to the book and you can see who these characters were. And you might have heard uh, about uh, Che from like uh, a t-shirt you saw, or you might have heard about Meyer Lansky from The Godfather. Um, but you can really dive in and better understand these characters and they can eventually get in and you can focus and pick up different uh, like books or articles or other media that you can experience to learn more about them. They're great gateways for education, They're great tools for learning. Um, and they're, they're just really good at those aspects. Okay, so what is a small war game? We've gone over kind of what a war game is, the why of a war game, now a small war game, the purpose of what we're here for today. Um, a small war game is a war game that consists of a low component count, small table presence, and that can be played in under an hour. What you see here is uh, what I mentioned before, a picture of our pup, Rugby. He's a rescue. We got him 
uh, a couple months ago now, I think it was October. Uh, yeah, uh, October. Um, and I thought that dogs were a good example uh, as a parallel to kind of war games in the sense that when you find a dog, when you go to the dog rescue and, and you're looking for the dog, you're looking for a dog that fits your lifestyle. You're looking for a dog that is going to either be an urban dog or that could be a uh, like a suburban dog. Uh, it might need a lot of exercise. It might be able to just run around the house, it might be a lap dog, all of these things. So when you're looking to find them, you're looking to find a uh, the right dog for you. And I think that that's very similar to war games in the sense that when I refer to small war games, not being diminutive by any means, small war games are really powerful. They pack a lot of punch in a small package, um, but they don't take away the value of larger games. It's just what's the right game at the time for the setting that you have. Uh, and that's why I put a picture of Rugby. And also, I love him. He's my best friend. I wanted to share him. Um, so I think before I get into a focus on small war games, I just wanted to stop and see if anybody had uh, questions. No questions right now, Joe. Great. Okay, uh, so focus on small war games. Uh, so what we're looking at here, I picked a couple that I wanted to go through to kind of uh, talk through, explain, uh, look into some of the mechanic sets and things that they have. Uh, so we'll be focusing on the narrative. Uh, what's the history behind the game, which is tied to the emotion. The mechanics, uh, how are the mechanics tied to the narrative, which ties into the strategy. And then the message, uh, what is the general thesis of the game, which ties into kind of the education. What does the designer want to get out of the game? Uh, the first of these games that I wanted to go over is the game uh, W1815 by Hanu Uisalto. Uistalo. Excuse me for that. Um, this is a really incredible game. Uh, so story time. Uh, I first played this when I went to the first San Diego uh, HISTCON convention, uh, which after the pandemic, you should all visit. It's incredible. It's a really awesome gaming experience. And I, and I played this one. And it was one I always wanted to play that I kind of read about and watched some videos about, but I actually had the opportunity. And I think it's just so great because what you have is something that is a classic battle. The Battle of Waterloo, the, the Prussians, the English, the Allies against the French, um, and a way to experience that in such a short amount of time where it allows the narrative to take over, where it allows you to really flow in and focus in on the, the whys and the hows and all the questions you have uh, because of the streamlined nature of the game. Um, so mechanically here, we're looking at something that's heavily action driven based on the cards, as you can see, and there's no direct movement. You can place things. So if you take control of Hugomont, you can place your cube there. You place the Prussians as they come onto the board, uh, but you're not directly moving and then you're losing those pieces uh, during combat based on the effect of roles that you take through the actions that you take. Um, one of the things that was done really well with this game is the fact that everything is so evidently displayed on the cards. Um, if you need to flip over a card for whatever reason, it lets you know that and shows you the result. You don't have to refer to a rule book. You can really just streamline and get the play experience in, which is what the designer wanted out of this and which is what makes it so good. If you had to get away from a shorter experience, you might lose out on some of that feeling and that narrative that comes in. But because everything is right in front of you and those choices you're making are just, they feel kind of more direct because everything's there, it allows for a more streamlined play. In this game, you're playing to break the other side by uh, adding, uh, removing pieces from their side, placing them on their board and then forcing their morale to go down. Um, this is a really incredible design. Uh, I think that it represents this classic battle really, really well. It offers a clever puzzle. Uh, it gives two players or a solo player the opportunity to experience this and make different changes and options. And I, I think the overall message of this game is uh, the designer wanted to show the Battle of Waterloo, the things that happened there, um, how those were 
uh, why they happened, and then what else different could have happened based on kind of the variables which come through dice by dice. This is a really great game. Uh, it's hard to find. I think currently it's out of print, but if you can find it, it it's well worth having a copy. All right, uh, Gettysburg. Gettysburg by Mark Herman. I also had the chance to play this at um, SD HisCon 2 uh, right before. It, I, no, actually, I didn't get to play it. I saw it. I saw it being played, and then I ordered it, and, the, and then I got to play it later on. But this is a really interesting one for me. It's a, it's a Herman design, so it's a real gem. Uh, I think the thing that I was really impressed by in this design is the way that it takes these key elements of a hex encounter war game and streamlines them and kind of distills them down to allow for ease of play and for the story to really take over. So the fascinating thing here is that you're looking at a whole map of Gettysburg. So over the course of the three days, days are broken into AM and PM, uh, you get to experience the full breadth of the battle. The troops moving in, getting into position, uh, causing casualties, taking ground, doing all of these things. Uh, and I think that for me, historically, there's just so many interesting bits here. For one, it really, it really displays the importance of the difference between movement and battle formations between troops. If you look on the map here, you can see uh, the early and roads. You see that early over there is in a march formation. That means that they can move farther. Um, and then the roads over there, you can look as flipped over there in a combat formation. Also does a really good job of displaying zone of control. It'd be a very tricky thing uh, in wargaming. It's something that as you play, you get more and more used to it. Uh, but it, uh, it's something for a new player that can be a little bit more difficult. Um, so what you do here is when you move into an adjacent space, you flip over into that battle formation, which is a great way to do that, that physical aspect of you take the piece, you flip it over. You've done that. You, you, you use that mechanical step and you use the component in a specific way in order to uh, activate that it is not only good for the game, but it's good for later on as people look into more and more different uh, experiences. Um, and then it's also just kind of a small, punchy, fun game at that. Um, the combat resolution system in here is also really nice too. It has an interesting artillery mechanic it uses stars rather than numbers to represent the power of attacks. And there is some terrain and things involved here, but I think that this represents the battle well. Gettysburg is a classic. There are like a, probably a hundred or more games on the battle that you can find that are really awesome uh, representations of it. But uh, what Mark Herman was able to do here was take this game, take this battle, distill it into something that is playable in a short amount of time that could be an introductory service or it could also be um, something that people just do for that experience of a better understanding that. So this kind of feeds into the educational aspect of these narratives and, and the purposes of these games. I think that this Gettysburg game and the Waterloo game, uh, W1815 that I showed, uh, are really good at showing how you could use this in a uh, classroom or how you could use this uh, alongside a, a good book or a movie about uh, these subjects to get a better understanding. Uh, the next game that I focus on is Shores of Tripoli by Kevin Bertram. This is a Fort Circle games. This is a, a, a new one that just came out finally, but they had done their Kickstarter before. Uh, it's a beautiful game. Um, it, it, it really leans in to the idea of the, the distillation. That what you have here is not a counter that lists the name of a ship and all the categories of a ship. You have a beautiful wooden component ship. If you have a cube that represents infantry, you don't have uh, kind of the NATO symbol on there uh, with a variety of different things. You just have a cube that needs a certain number to hit on the die. Um, Mechanically, I think that works really well for this game. It's card driven. The cards are really evocative. They have really pretty art. They do a really good job of telling the story of something that not a lot of people know about and is a really interesting chapter of American history. Like if you talk to most people and you ask them what they knew of the Barbary Wars, 
I, I, I don't know really what they would say. So I think that games like this are a really good opportunity and they show how you can take these subjects that are lesser known, how you can create uh, really elegant designs that are open to a large swath of people um, from really experienced kind of grabnard gamers to uh, newer gamers or younger kids or people who might play different things and give them that experience. And it shows you how the ability to use games as an educational tool is really powerful. Um, and I played this game a couple of times now and I really enjoy it. Um, I really like the dice rolling in this game. I think that dice rolling is something that gets derided a lot, but has a lot of benefit in smaller games. One of the things that I found uh, through designing the landing and other kind of smaller things I've worked on is that uh, if you have a shorter experience, the luck of the dice plays into it a little bit less. Uh, you're enjoying that experience, that shared learning experience, that ha the strategic experience with someone else. Uh, and if it's short enough, and if it doesn't go your way, uh, then you can just do it again. It's unlike a lot of other games where there's a really long setup and you build to it and you end up in a bad position and you're just kind of stuck. Like the shorter games give the opportunity for more plays, better understanding, repetition and more learning from there. So I think this is, I'm excited to see what Four Circle does in the future. And, and this is, was a really cool design. And I, I hope that they keep it with the uh, kind of clean and lean with the components uh, and uh, really beautiful card art, and very evocative kind of storytelling. Russo Japanese War by Hariba uh, Wataru. Uh, this, this game has a story to it. Uh, I saw there's a, a, a student of history in Canada, his name's Joe Fonseca, uh, who I saw on Twitter was talking about this game and how he had translated the rules of it. And I remember from the first time I saw it, uh, I was really fascinated by it. And it was something that really captured me and made me really think about, wow, this is a fascinating kind of chapter of history that I don't know that much about. I'd love to learn more about it. Um, I really want to play this game, but it's in Japanese. Uh, so until I found a version of the rule book that was translated or it got picked up by another publisher who published it in English, I didn't feel I'd be able to play it. But luckily, Joe went through, translated everything, so I was able to pick it up. And then I actually reached out to him because it's kind of a harder game to find, but uh, you're able to find it through some sources. Uh, and there are some specific shops online that'll buy things from Japan and then send them to the United States. So that's how I got this. But this is a really beautiful uh, design and a really interesting game. Low component count, uh, similar to the rest of the games that we see here, um, with a real heavy focus on supply lines. Uh, and uh, telling this really compelling story of the Russo-Japanese War and the fight over Port Arthur and kind of the naval battles that ensued from there. Uh, the thing that really stuck out for me with this design, and I think one of the fascinating chapters of this war is uh, around the naval theater that was fought here. So you had the Battle of Tsushima, you had fights around Port Arthur, you had these huge dreadnought ships that were fighting at the turn of the century, and it's really evocative and powerful and big ships, big fights, uh, really in, in, incredibly, incredibly moving narratives. So how do you represent that in a small space for a war game that's mainly focused on a land battle? Um, I think that the designer was really, really clever in the way that they did it. There are two naval boxes here. The first is for the Baltic fleet that starts all the way up in the Baltic and has to inch its way around to get into the fight. And then below you have the box that uh, where you see Japan and you see the Sea of Japan and the Yellow Sea. And then you see the Russian fleets from Port Arthur and uh, Vladivostok and then the two in Japan. And they kind of go and fight it out and they're fighting it out over the supply. Now, what is the effect of supply in this game? Supply helps you move, do uh, additional or special types of moves, and it really helps in combat. So if you look uh, down at number 11 and 12, those spaces there, if you were to fight in a combat there, just base combat, you would each side would roll a die, meaning to roll equal to or lower than the result on that uh, token. So for the Japanese, you would need to roll three or less, Russian, you would need to revolt too. If you were looking at that combat, you'd say, okay, 
that's it. We roll off. But I want to support it more. I, I want to give myself better odds. How do I do that? Well, you spend supply. So for the Japanese player, they could spend two supply. They would roll three dice. And then they would uh, have a chance of hitting uh, a three or less on all three of those dice. Um, I think that that's a really interesting mechanic in itself, showing the importance of these supply lines, the flow of everything, how you how, how you replenish your troops, how you do these things. Um, but it also ties in really well to this naval theater and the importance of the fight going on there that the Japanese had to make sure that they created the necessary supply lines to continue their push. Now there are more powerful troops, you see they're a three to a two, um, but they're dependent on this supply to win in a fight against the Russians. The Russians are getting a pretty steady flow of supply coming in. There's no negative effect. Uh, and there's even one boost that they can take in the game. But for the Japanese, it all depends on control of the Yellow Sea and the Sea of Japan. Uh, for the Sea of Japan, if that's controlled, you get either uh, one or two. If you don't control it, you get zero. And then for the Yellow Sea, you have, um, you roll a D3 if it's shared control, you roll D6 if it's not. Um, it's just a really fascinating mechanic in a way to tell that story. And I thought that what it, what it does is it shows the importance of these supply lines, the role of the Navy, and it takes a specific mechanic and ties it so nicely into the narrative um, that it really assists in, in, in telling this story. Um, the last one I want to focus on is one of my favorite games ever. Uh, I know that every, everybody has that game uh, that kind of sticks out to them, especially uh, in the different genres of games. But for small war games, it's table battles. And the, oh, I skipped over. Sorry about that. So the thing about this game that's really so compelling to me is it's also not Tom Holland's <laughs> last, but anyway. Um, the thing that's so compelling about this game to me is the fact that you have cards and you have these sticks and you have dice, and that those components are so kind of simple and they're used for so many different things. And like you, you set them out in this game and you have this, like, like these pieces, but they, but they can tell so many different stories. And I think that's the fascinating thing about this type of game design is that you have the ability to tell incredibly fascinating and focused stories uh, on so many different things with just this small set of the same components. So you can do everything from fighting uh, the Battle of Brooklyn to fighting uh, the Wars of Alexander. Uh, it's really clever use of dice, uh, driving those actions. Um, it's authentic yet abstract. It tells these stories in really evocative ways and it's just a really clever design. I really love it. Um, before I get on to my game, I'll stop. I wanted to see if there were any questions. So, Joe, one of the questions I have from the previous emails is, what makes uh, creating a simple game difficult while capturing yeah. all these elements that you you sort of lay down in terms of narrative, mechanics, and message? Yeah, most definitely. And that's kind of the... That's the like the final part of the the presentation that I'll be getting into. But that's um, that was like the big question for myself when I saw these designs and when I played around with them before I decided that I wanted to make my own. And and how do I how do I take and how do I distill, and how do I create these experiences in, in this way? Um, so yeah, I'll I I promise I'm I'm getting to that, uh, and, and that'll be coming up after after this little break. You can press on, Joe. Cool. All right, great. Uh, so The Landing. This is the game that I designed. Um, it's the story of the Aussies, the Kiwis, and Indians uh, landing at Anzac Cove and the difficulty of trying to attain a near impossible task. Um, the mechanic set here is uh, the use of variable cards as the map. 
cards and action dice uh, are kind of the lead here in the mechanics with a focus on stress and spirit. I also included a journaling phase uh, to help drive the narrative in this. And then the message is to tell the story of the individual soldiers rather than glory of battles won or lost and about the futility of the conflict and the bravery of those who fought. So to get to Sebastian's question, designing the landing. So how do you distill these things? How do you take it and how do you kind of compact all of these things to make a, a small war game that kind of packs this punch? Um, and I wanted to show all of you kind of the, the games that inspired me before to give some examples. Some of you may have played them, uh, some of you may have seen them, but this is kind of how I took what I learned from those and then I ended up uh, creating the landing. So the first step of this is in distilling that history. Uh, crafting a strong story based on the history and the historiography. Um, so really looking into the essence of the story that I wanted to tell, how I wanted to tell that, and how I wanted to use the mechanics to tell that. The design constraints. So for a smaller game, you don't have the luxury of unlimited, uh, uh, unlimited resources that you can use. You, you're focusing on a set number of cards, or a set number of dice or a set number of components in order to tell your story. And then you have the narrative focus, the focus on the experience, the education, and the enjoyment in the design. First to distilling the history. So for the landing, uh, the reason why I decided to design a game on Gallipoli all started when my uh, wife and I went on a trip to Australia. My wife's a photographer. She got accepted into a program uh, on the Gold Coast in Australia. Uh, it was like a week long, and then uh, we were gonna do like a week kind of visiting around some different places in Australia. But I was gonna have some time where she was really busy, where I didn't uh, really have anything to do. So I said, okay, I'm gonna bring some games with me. And I started looking around for different games about Australia, uh, kind of things th themed to the area. And uh, then I said, okay, well maybe I'll design my own thing. And then I'll look into how I can do that and how I can kind of tell uh, a story, like connect myself to it. I think that we all find that when we visit places or when we do certain things, we like to connect to it and we like to read histories about it. And, focus on those stories and, and all of that. So what I ended up doing is looking into uh, Gallipoli. At the time I was reading a lot about World War I and then I came upon Gallipoli and I found a good book by Peter Hart that I started reading and then that led me to the Australian War Memorial. Um, and they have an incredible, like vast number of resources via their website. So almost everything in their collection is virtual. So it was really easy for me uh, being in California to check out and read and see these things. And one of the key things that was coming across, particularly when I was reading the journals uh, and some of the official histories was just this intense bravery. And the fact that you have these soldiers that are going into an invasion of a place that they've never been to. They've already traveled so far from Australia to Egypt, up to Lemnos, and then on to the peninsula. Um, you know, these are like the, the, the camaraderie between them, that kind of Anzac spirit was already really foundationally there. Um, and then ending up landing in the wrong place and having to rectify that and having a specific task of reaching the third ridge so that they would have the opportunity to kind of take these forts that were overlooking the Dardanelles. A, a, a briefer on uh, the Gallipoli campaign, this was 1915. During World War I, you have uh, the Ottoman Empire and the, um, the Entente decided that they wanted to try to uh, take Istanbul and knock the Ottomans out of the war. So this was kind of the brainchild of the Sea Lord, uh, Winston Churchill, and uh, various other leaders that they would send all these troops in. And the British were fighting kind of at the southern tip of the Gallipoli Peninsula. You had the French on the other side. The idea was that there were these forts that they needed to knock out that prevented their fleets from going up into Istanbul. Um, so, I was looking at this whole big history and reading about it, and it was something specifically about the landing 
uh, at Anzac Cove on the 25th that really drove me. I think it was the fact that it's, it's so steeped in Australian legend. Um, it was such an impactful and important battle uh, for the Anzacs because it was really their first experience in combat. And it just became this thing that was so foundational for the nation that I was going to visit that I'd never been to that I just kind of really picked up on. So what I did is I looked at the scope as a whole. So Gallipoli, you have the naval campaign, the first battles to get in to the forts where they weren't able to get in. You have the, uh, the landing by the Anzacs on the 25th. And then you have the August offensive where the Anzacs are trying to break through in the peninsula to cut off uh, some of the Ottomans farther down south and move closer to taking these forts. Um, and you have just this incredibly, you have so many stories, like so many really incredible stories, but I think the one that I stuck with was Anzac Cove. And I said, okay, so this is a story I wanna tell. So the constraint that I gave myself from reading through this, from reading through journal entries, from doing all this was, let's focus on this, like this one bit. So then what I did is I looked specifically at the resources that I had, that I had experienced and things that I hadn't, to find out more about this specific thing. So I tried to become as much of an expert as I could about this specific day and the events of that day who landed there, when they landed, why they landed, what their goals were, what happened. So taking all of this history to all this kind of world that's going on in my head, as you can hear me kind of explaining, it was a lot at first and then distilling it down to say, okay, this is the focus. And this is the point that I want to address that I want to talk about in my game. I want to talk about specifically the landing. Next, once I picked and kind of distilled that, there was a strong focus on, okay, well, what's the, like within that history, is there any other specific thing that I really want to address? And I think one of the other things that I wanted to focus on was within the landing, the experience of the individual soldier that was there on that day. So you have somebody who, in, in the game, you have somebody who's coming from Western Australia, uh, who was a, a cattle rancher, miner, uh, somebody from that area of the country in the bush, um, who has traveled across the world farther than they've ever traveled before and is facing this kind of unseen, unknown enemy. Um, so that's represented in the game, uh, and I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, but one of the things that I was really lucky to be able to do with this experience in designing the game was actually going and visiting the War Memorial. I took a couple days when uh, my wife was in her, uh, her, um, her class, or the classes she was doing, and I got to go. This picture you see here is from the entrance. Um, and it's one of the boats that was used on the day of the landing. So it was really an emotional thing for me. And I think it really tied the emotion of the whole, what I was trying to distill, that like this boat with the bullet holes in it that was found after the battle, like the incredible kind of, the, 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 the emotion from something like this. And then walking through and seeing all of it, it, it really drove me to say, I want to tell this story, but I want to make sure I do it with honor. Uh, and that I, I, I do it the right way. And it was all from that distilling of the, the larger bits that I saw that kind of drove me to say, okay, how do I take this history that I see, this, the, th these letters that these soldiers wrote, these artifacts that I was able to see, um, and how do I tell this? Then it gets into the design constraints. Before I get into the design constraints, Sebastian, are there any questions? Yeah, there are a couple. Um, yeah. One is, is loss of immersion, uh, immersive experience a trade-off with these types of games? If so, to what degree? And how can it be avoided? If not, how can we create a greater immersive experience? Yeah, that's a, that's a super awesome question. I think that one of the best ways to do that is to be as... Um, the best way to create an immersive experience is to keep the focus of the player on the game. So what that means is that if you're able to put the actions that are happening or the choices that the players are making right in front of them, um, 
they're not going to be kind of taking their eyes away to look at a rule book. Um, if they're doing anything outside of the play, it's them thinking through the strategy of how they want to approach the simulation. I think going back to uh, W1815, uh, one of the things in that uh, design that is done really well is everything is laid out on the cards in front of you. Every choice you make, you read down, you find that action, and you take that action. So it's almost like the action itself becomes secondary to the experience of whatever the action is creating. Um, I think that there are certain times where you have to pull people, like you can't fully immerse somebody in a board game in the same way you can like a, like a VR experience or in a, a video game experience. Uh, but just by focusing on mechanics, they're very transparent in the play area. Um, what you're able to do is really tell uh, a more powerfully immersive story because the players uh, really not having to do the mental work of figuring out those next steps. It's all right there in front of them. So it allows them to kind of get in the character and do things. Another benefit that I found to immersion is uh, writing. There was a game that I played. There's this really cool series, um, XX72 is the name of the series. And it was done, I forget the name of the designer, but it's this really cool series of games that are all roll and write uh, that focuses in on a journaling phase. So you write down what happened during the turn uh, and it's a really cool way to add that immersive level to it. That normally you're kind of going through these things in your head, these are solo games, but when you're playing and doing this um, and then adding that additional layer to writing down what your character is experiencing kind of helps with that immersion. But I would say the best way to keep immersion is to put it all out in front of the player, make it so there's not a lot outside of the play area that they need to reference. And that if you do need the player to be drawn out of the immersive experience for whatever reason, um, that you have a like a good specific reason as as to why, and maybe even include that in the process of immersion. If you're if if you're focusing on a design where you want a player to experience uh, two different experiences, then you can purposefully have a break. You can say, okay, go to this card, focus on this card. What does this say? Or focus on this sheet. What does this sheet say? So that to the point of immersion, that's what I would say. So Joe, on, on a similar aspect is when narrowing down the key variables in order to simply depict a complex historical battle campaign or, or war to enable simple game design, how do you avoid imposing a singular, singular or possibly distorted interpretation of the variables or variables that determine why events turned out the way they did? Yeah, that's an excellent point. And I think that all really comes down to the historiography of it. Um, the, what you have to do is you have to realize that, that when you are designing a uh, war game, you're taking on a responsibility. Uh, that responsibility is that you treat that, that history and that information with, with respect and the way you tell it um, and in the, the purpose behind the, the reasoning for the design. Like, why, why are you doing this and why are you telling this aspect of the story? So, if we're taking something like Anzac Code, I'll use this as the example. Uh, you have the story is a solitaire game told from the perspective of the Anzacs against the Ottomans. I wanted to make sure that I didn't portray the Ottomans as this like th this monster, like that was never the idea of, of this design. And, and, and I really feel like it doesn't portray them in that way. And that all stemmed from the reading that I had done and kind of the modern uh, history and historiography around the battle, wherein people view the impact of both sides and really kind of like the, the negative aspect of the Anzac invasion of Gallipoli. Um, and it's just so, th th there's such a, it, there's so many interesting currents in that one of the main people I read for this was um, uh, uh, C.W. Bean, who was the official uh, historian of the um, 
uh, Australian army and was kind of set out there and it was his responsibility to kind of track and tell these stories and he told them really beautifully uh, and you know it was something that I took a lot from but I also realized that this was written in 1919 this was written in the moment of the battle so it's not something that I could rely or, or focus everything on in the design that I was doing. Uh, reading more modern scholarship, you get a better feel for the reasoning behind certain things, the, the actions that everybody took, um, and I think focusing on the sacrifices that were made on both sides by people who, who were kind of put in something that uh, there was a lot of futility around. When it comes to other experiences, I, I can't speak to all of those because I haven't done, like, I, I don't know exactly the subject, but what I would say is if, if you're going to tell a story simply, um, if you feel like the story you're telling isn't, is one-sided or isn't fair, um, there are a wealth of uh, professors uh, and uh, historians and other people uh, who you can reach out to uh, and you can show these things to and you can talk to them. I think one of the greatest powers we have as designers is the ability to reach out to others and find experts in those fields and talk to them and, and see what they have to say. Like, make sure that when you're telling a story, you're doing it with the full scope involved and that you're not just doing it uh, for the sake of doing it. That, you're, you're, that your purpose, the educational aspects of it, are really driving um, your reasoning for the creation of the game so that you don't get caught up in these tropes. This, this kind of happened with, I did, um, I worked on a small game about the torpedo squadrons at Midway. So I read about them, uh, I saw the movie uh, Midway and just a whole bunch of things when I went to the, uh, when I went to the USS Midway in San Diego, they had a special exhibition on uh, the torpedo squadrons, and it's just this really tragic story. Um, but one of the fascinating things about the story of the Battle of Midway is the the code that was uh, broken by the Americans, the the Japanese naval code. Nobody knew about that until much later on. It was confidential and then eventually it became declassified. So if you focus on a, a primary source, which is very important when you're doing things around history, you're missing out on things that are, you could be missing out on some major plot points in the story that you're trying to tell. So focus on the modern historiography. Um, and if you're uncertain, um, realize that your name is attached to it and, and contact somebody who you feel could help you better tell that story. Um, I was very lucky with Anzac Cove, which became the landing, that I put it out there in Board Game Geek and I shared it with people and I got some really good feedback on, well, don't forget this and don't forget that. In fact, if you look at this right here, Australian 11th Battalion, this game was solely Aussies. Uh, no Kiwis. Uh, no Indians were in this design. And then after I started talking to some people, they said, well, you're missing a whole aspect of this story. And then I said, oh, you're right. And then I went back and I, I did some additional reading and I looked at some other sources and I found it. So, you know, it, it's, it's a process. Um, it might not be perfect the first time, but the, there's a lot of people out there to help. And so long as you were focused on the fidelity of the, the design, it, it's going to show and it's going to be uh, good. And I think that um, you'll end up with uh, something you're proud of at the end. Hey, Joe, to follow up on that is that as you're deciding what to include and what to exclude in your uh, in, in both the storytelling element, but also in terms of what actions to model in your game, um, do you have any tips or techniques that you use specifically that you use for uh, Gallipoli or any of your other game designs that you would you know, share with us? Yeah, of course. I, I think one of the things that I found, and it came from working with Catastrophe Games on the landing, uh, was having a core set of mechanics that you trust, that you've worked with, um, that are flexible, is, is, is good. You got to think of it like a toolbox. Um, where you know that you've kind of created the right tool to fit a certain situation. Uh, I would say 
like building that toolbox and focusing on a set of mechanics that you trust that you know can kind of accurately tell a story. One of the one of my favorites and something that I use a lot is the idea of spirit. I, I really like we're playing board games, they're violent, but my focus is less on the idea of the violence and more on the idea of the, the the spirit, the mentality of those involved. So in here what you're what you're saying is not necessarily like if you look at the the Australian 11th Battalion card here, it has a spirit of three. When your spirit's reduced, it, it represents the, like, the retreat, the, the loss of the desire to fight. Um, so that allows me, when I'm looking at distilling these histories and telling these kind of smaller stories to say, okay, I, I don't want to focus on kind of the blood and guts of this, I wanna focus on the human aspect of what the people experienced. Um, and spirit is something that I kind of keep going back to that I trust. I, I think the other thing too is to tell your story too, um, and then like the, the real important aspects of it. I, I, there are a lot of serious games that tackle really serious issues, uh, and small war games can do that really well, equally as well as larger games. It's about making sure that you have a foundational, um, like you can cite it, like you can cite why you're saying that that's gonna happen. Um, when you're choosing a certain mechanic or when you're looking at a certain bit of history and how you're doing that, you're making sure that you are really understanding uh, the, like the, that just that it's, it's purpose driven. Um, but there are trade-offs you have to make. There are things you have to leave out. Um, there are aspects of the story that you, you're not going to be able to tell because it's smaller. And in that case, what I would say is if you find yourself designing a small war game, feeling like you're running out of space, just go bigger. It doesn't need to like, like realize that not, while well, small war games are really beneficial, not everything has to be a small war game. Just like when I showed the picture of my dog earlier, like, uh, a, a Chayon, uh, a Chihuahua Papillon mix works really well for a two-bedroom apartment in Berkeley um, because it's the right fit for us. So if you find as the designer that you feel like you're pushing too hard on these limits, uh, free yourself up a little bit um, or look, really look with a critical eye and use those resources around you uh, to help you uh, defend the positions that you're taking. Hey, Joe, uh, looking at the time, I have some more questions, but I want you to keep pressing on so we can make sure you finish your presentation. Yeah, I, I've got only got, uh, a, a, I actually don't mind taking more questions out. I only have a couple slides left. All right, then to follow up is, if you want to design a small war game to model future or modern war, rather than simply replaying a historical battle or campaign, how would that affect your design considerations do you leave space for different contingencies? That's, that's super interesting. It's something I thought of as well as how are you, how are you modeling things that we might not fully know or understand in the moment, um, but still using the medium as a way to kind of tell the story. I think that what I would suggest in those cases is that seems like very, it's finding the right mechanics. So once again, in this case, there's no history you're working off of, but if you're saying in the future, there's some type of technology that you're focused on, like the, maybe for this example, I'll use like some type of cyber warfare. I'm not a huge expert in the field by any means, but using this as the example, if there are papers you've read or, or trends you've seen in the way that you expect certain things to be, what you do is you, you take that and then you find a mechanic that you like, that you've worked with or something you haven't. Um, and you attach that to it and you say, okay, with this set mechanic, I am going to uh, tell this story of something that I think is going to happen based on these reasons. And then there's like, there's also some relation that you can always find back, like I, I think if you're focusing on kind of science fiction stuff, which is not like 
not like really hard like Star Wars sci-fi, but if you're looking at more kind of like realistic sci-fi things, you can find parallels between existing kind of mechanics and games or things you found in other games. I, I, a big thing that I was watching uh, Brian Train's talk and being able to play other games and find things and, and see those mechanics is, is, is really an important set. It's a very interesting question. I think it's just find the right mechanic that matches it as closely as you think it can. Um, use some type of foundational background to make it or create that foundational background and then explain it. Because that's the big thing that I've seen. If you're able to defend the position you take, then, it, then I think that you, you, you have the necessary fidelity. So to follow up on that is you mentioned having a toolbox and mechanics and things you, you, you reference in your game in, in designing these simple games. Uh, what are, can you name like your know, two or three mechanics that either you use in the landing or you've seen in other simple design games that you think are, are good places to start to experiment with? Yeah, uh, the first one I would say is cards, um, which kind of feeds into this slide here. Um, cards are incredible and variable in the way that you can tell a story in a small space. So if you see that bench right there is from Cairns, Australia, where I, I went after I had gone to uh, the war memorial with my wife who went and uh, went to the the Great Barrier Reef did like snorkeling and stuff. It was cold. It was winter when we went, but it was nice. But you see that box right there? That was uh, all the components that I had. And that was the limitation that I had given myself. And I told myself mechanically, because I played around a bit with cards as a board and other designs, um, that they offer a really interesting opportunity in that if you can set them up in a grid, like a three by four by three, or if you put them in a line and then you can have them either set where they're face up or face down where it changes over time and you can add some variability to the uh, design and what you're working on. I think that's a great uh, tool to use, the mechanics of the variability of the cards. I would also say uh, like, uh, basic combat systems. So focusing on one of, I use combat value, but it has a lot of different names, strength, all of those things. So having a set uh, number that you need to hit on a die. And then I also think, as I said before, with uh, Shores of Tripoli, dice are really important. Uh, dice give you a lot of flexibility in your design. Uh, they give you the opportunity to tell a very, uh, like, an interesting and variable story. Um, and because it's short, if somebody has bad dice in one game, they can always play again. Um, so there's a little bit of freedom there. I've found that people are kind of comfortable with that. So I would suggest focus on cards, solely using cards for your map, uh, for your action cards, for all those things, taking the board out of it, uh, focusing on dice and giving yourself a number of components, and then just saying, that's it, and not going past that. So one, uh, next question is sort of a follow-up to a previous one about the immersive question is uh, laying everything out in the game, example in terms of card-driven games, but what could be confused with the focus instead of immersiveness? So to what degree do you need to include historical content as, as opposed to mechanics? So this sort of speaks to uh, immersive versus game mechanic balance and that tension and how much is it a burden? I think that the the medium, that's a really good question. So for me, what I found is that by tying everything together through a card, so it, it's right in front of us, so I keep using it, but it's a good example to use. The Bayonets card that you see there, um, your, able to express the, so the way these cards work, I'll explain them. So essentially what you have is you have a hand of cards and you randomly choose them. They represent the different tools that you can use. So your bayonets, rifle fire, uh, spirit, things like that. Um, through that card, because it lists out 
the specifics of what happened during that action, it kind of takes the, the guesswork out of it um, and that you're not having to check to a player aid or anything like that. It's very apparent what it is that you're doing. Um, I think that sometimes it, 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 the, the trick is based in the imagination of the player in that if you use too many components for things, you can draw them out of the immersive nature of whatever it is they're experiencing. So you can be using cards, but if you have 50 different cards in front of them that they have to reference, that draws away from the narrative. I, I, I think that the, the simplicity of putting as much as you can on things and also mechanically making, like pulling back, like the, not everything has to be incredibly complex in order to have um, like the, the value or tell the educational story that you're focused on. I, I, that was a that was a good question. I hope I answered that. So to follow up on that, as when you were designing the landing, were there any mechanics that you you weeded out for simplicity's sake, or to keep to distill it further? Yes. So w one of the things that I did originally was having a variety of different um, Ottoman troops. So like the, maybe there were snipers or maybe there were gun emplacements, or maybe there were things like that. Uh, and one of the things I found with that is that while it did add some interesting uh, flexibility to the design, it, it just kind of took away from the overall and that it, it added some additional rules and things you would need to check so that if you were in a combat and you saw a variety of different tokens, you'd say, okay, what does this token do? What does this token do? What does this token do? And you might need to reference that. But I just said, okay, for the Ottomans, if we just have the sergeant and then a cube, and you know that the cube is always this value and the sergeant is always this value with this ability, uh, I, I, I pulled back there and I found that it was worth it. Um, in, in the future, is that an area that I'd like to explore a bit more? Like, I think so, yeah. Um, but that was one of the big ones that I that I pulled away. So Joe, what about you continue on as I gather up the other questions from the chat? Yeah, sounds good. So it, luckily we kind of went over there um, a lot of the uh, things around design constraints. The, the, the big thing, one of the big things that drove me uh, for this was Board Game Geek, they have some really great design contests that you can do. Um, and for one of them, I was focused on a nine card game, which is just such an interesting like thing I'd never thought of. It's like, all right, nine cards, 18 components, make a game. What are you going to do? And this was before I had worked on the landing. So for this, it was just this kind of silly game about vampires and grenzers and stuff that I'd worked through in my head. Um, and I had taken everything that would normally be on like a board or played through and really pushed it down. And it was a lot because there were definitely things you had to take out if you're making something only nine cards with only 18 uh, components. I was talking to Sebastian about this earlier. It's like, I look at these as like design exercises. How do I kind of push my brain to solve whatever that design puzzle is? Um, and then through that, was born the land because I said, okay, I'm going to give myself design constraints, but a little bit more. I need to give myself 27 cards. I'm going to give myself more components. Um, I'm going to give myself some more flexibility in telling the story, and that was super helpful for me. And then it's telling the story, the narrative that I wanted to have. Um, so taking all of this, all of the history that I had looked at, the things that I had distilled, um, just the history that I had distilled, uh, it was how can I effectively model the things that I saw. And for me, one of the big things that I saw was this plaque here from the Anzac Memorial uh, in Sydney. Now, when I saw this, it really struck me because I am a war game designer. I love designing war games. I, I love the model of them and, and the effect of them and what they do in the strategy but there was something in my head that i always knew that i'd never really thought of in depth um and when i read this the designed to express with dignity and simplicity neither the glory nor the glamour of war 
with those nobler tributes of human nature, uh, which the war of 1914 and 1918 so vividly brought forth, courage, endurance, and sacrifice. I read this and it really touched me. Uh, and it was something I wanted to make sure that I expressed in a game. That what you're doing here is you're, you're fighting, you're, you're pushing your troops, you're doing these things. But there's violence inherent in it. But the point of the story is not the violence. The point of the story is the, the conditions that these soldiers were put in, the futility of a really, really impossible task. The other thing with this game is it's hard. And it's purposefully hard because what they were actually doing was very difficult, um, almost impossible. Some of them ended up reaching the third ridge, but they eventually got pushed back. And then as we know, it kind of devolved into trench warfare. Um, and I, I wanted to express that. And that was the, the focus and the thesis of this game. And that what I wanted people to leave with is this impression and this kind of, educational bit in that this is about that courage, that endurance, that sacrifice. Um, so that was the a real like a point for me in telling this story. And then once again, just this is it. Um, and this is kind of uh, what I ended up getting to from going through that process. Um, I, I absolutely love these questions. They're really great. I have, I definitely have a lot more time for them. The last thing I wanted to touch on was um, throughout everything I've been talking about, uh, most of these are very Western or completely Western centric. I am a, uh, I'm an American male war game designer. Um, my stories and the way I tell them uh, are through my lens and, and, and my view. Um, I think that I, I want to see more stories told by more people. Um, I, I think that as a, uh, as, as a field, um, in no matter what it is, if you focus on strong diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion, uh, it always gets better. Uh, the Zenobia Awards is something that I think is really incredible uh, that offers a really good opportunity for us to tell and educate ourselves on these stories that we, we might be missing out on. Um, and what I would say is that if you're like me and you find stories that are interesting, that are kind of outside of your cultural perspective, um, find people who can help you tell those stories. There's a, a design that I've been working on for some time based around a really fascinating uh, siege, similar to like an Alamo type siege during the Haitian Revolution called the Creta Piero. Um, that I, I, I worked on as a print and play and I, I'm, I'm looking to refine, but I found a historian that I worked with on that. I found a Haitian artist to kind of help me tell that story. But there are people to hear, there are people around who wanna help you tell these stories. Um, just make sure that you find the right people and that you are uh, doing it authentically and, and with that fidelity. And that's it. So to summarize some of the comments slash questions in the, in the chat is, uh, why did you decide to use cards instead of like a, a map, which is more common for game? Oh yeah, the main reason is space. So as I referenced before with my family, uh, I have two kids that are seven uh, and I live in a two bedroom apartment. So when I would ever go to set up a big map, uh, I would never have enough space. So I would put it on the floor and then I'd set all the chits out and then like my three-year-olds would run around and grab the pieces or I'd have to move it off the dinner table for dinner. I, I, I didn't really have the setup to do that. So it was out of necessity when I started designing that I said, okay, I'll use cards. Uh, and I'll use cards to help me kind of uh, set up quick, pack down small, uh, and hopefully get the same kind of feelings out of it. So cards were a big driver for me just out of the necessity for myself, but then also the portability. The fact that it's much easier to take a bunch of cards and put it in a backpack than it is kind of a, a larger box. So necessity was the mother of, uh, of innovation there. So to follow up on that, the being liberated from the map, right, which is often static, uh, offer any interesting design choices or um, elements into your game that you would you would otherwise not have with a standard map? The, the flexibility of uh, hidden aspects. So 
like uh, in the landing, you have a card that uh, turns over. So it, you don't know what it is until you land on the card. Um, I think that uh, that would be much more difficult. You need an additional component to represent that in a game or on a map. Um, whereas if you're setting up a row of cards, you can have some flipped over so they're unknown. So it adds that kind of variable to it. Um, and then I think the other thing is it makes you really think about the map. I've started working on some games that I don't need to use cards to make the map, and there's so much more freedom that I have now in it. Whereas if I'm looking to use cards, I really have to make sure that everything fits, and I have to think about how it fits. It makes you think spatially in a different way about the areas, and I feel like it's still fairly representative of the experience of just having a standard map. So I really like that element you just brought up in terms of having unknown parts of the terrain ahead of you, right? Like in the sense that you are that soldier, you can come over the ridge and be like, oh no, there's this giant terrain feature here that I didn't mm -hmm. see that is often missing in these sort of like bird's eye view maps of in a lot of war games. Mm -hmm. So I really like that. Um, and I will try to use that in the future now. Um, Another question is, have you thought about bringing this game to a digital platform? And if so, what are some of the obstacles in doing that? So yes, I, I, I think that a lot of the way I think about these types of small word game designs is in line with um, apps and like app games that you find. I think that there are some really cool similarities in the, like the, the way that you adjust it. I think that if I were to take something like the landing and turn it into a computer game, um, I would, it's so funny because I've been playing so much with Tabletop Simulator, which feels like I'm playing computer game board games all the time, <laughs> you know? Um, uh, I think that it would just be looking into some of the additional com component aspects that you can do with uh, uh, video game media. The fact that like the way cards flip, the way things are hidden, the way you can you can do things like what you were just talking about, uh, Sebastian, with kind of the hidden cards. Like you can do that much easier in a computer game. You, you can add different types of art styles in the way that you tell stories as well too. Apologies, my dog uh, crashed my uh, Zoom session here. Uh, no. Next question is, can you give us a few examples of, of abstractions that you had to make in a small game that you wouldn't have made if trying to tell the same story in a more traditionally robust war game? Yeah. Um, seems to I, have, I just changed my desk around. I used to have everything with my uh, hands, but I'll pull this out. So I, I recently did, uh, just for fun, and please, Disney, this is just for fun, a print play about uh, the Battle of Hoth. Um, which is fairly similar to kind of some of the systems I use. So what I did in this, um, let me find a good one, it is here. Please roll over. So in order to represent a snow speeder or a, a, a plane coming through, I use this rogue leader card. So normally in a larger game, uh, you would be able to represent uh, something like a, like a plane or a fighter attack or a fighter bomber attack uh, with a specific token with maybe specific assets, maybe uh, some type of, like, a, maybe it's flippable, maybe it, it has various steps that it takes, uh, maybe it has its own diagram that it follows for all the different hits and things that it could do. So for this, the abstraction is down to a card, that playing that card, you can only play once per turn, you may not get it the next turn. It represents the fact that you have a plane flying over a field, and then having to come around to come back again. Um, and that it might not come back in time or there might be something that does it. So using a card to kind of abstract, that uh, is definitely one of the trade-offs that, that you have to make in kind of a smaller design. Also to sort of follow up on that question is, how does scoping your, your subject matter from the very beginning um, differ from simple games to let's say a more traditional war game because your game is very like, it's at the individual level, right? Which yeah. is very unique for um, a lot of war games. Yeah. So that is big, uh, a big focus on the narrative 
um, in how I want to drive the the story specifically there. So I find that you know you can always pare down. And you have a, a lot of really good games that are done at a very kind of like a like a platoon or a squad level. Um, but it's really leaning in on a connection because if you're fighting and you're using like full regiments or corps or divisions, there's a little bit less of a connection you have to that individual piece because it's a, it feels more like a piece. If you can make the individual token or, or chit or whatever represent a, like a person or represent maybe a couple people, um, it, it, it adds to the kind of, power that you can drive out of it. One of the, um, the, um, there's a, the name of the game, like Castle Itter, like the, the solitaire games David Thompson does, are really good at this. They represent the individual with the chit and the things that are happening to that individual. And they really draw that narrative in, in a really beautiful way. So uh, this is more of a subjective question and it is, uh, is, uh, the question asks, I want the game, uh, great short games make me wanting more. I want the game to continue and not to start all over. For me, this is a pitfall. Do you know the feeling? If so, what can be done from a design perspective to avoid this feeling? Yeah, I, I definitely get the feeling. I think that there are times when you finish something and the experience is so fun and you're like, oh, it's over. I'm like, oh, I can play it again, but it's the same thing. I Like for that, I look a lot to... I think that there's an opportunity to chain these stories together. And that's something I've been thinking a lot about design wise is how could I take something like the landing and have it tell multiple stories. So like, what if it tells the story of the landing and then it immediately goes to the following days after or the following months after, and then it goes to the August offensive and then it goes to the fighting before the winter, and then it goes to the evacuation process. I, I think that you can chain together smaller game experiences. And this is very similar to like, um, like a lot of really good video games and computer games that do the same, like roguelikes and, and things like that. There's the big one out now, Hades, uh, that I've enjoyed. But that you can kind of chain those stories together. Um, but extrapolating it, like blowing it up, you could. It would be a different experience. Um, one of the other things I've thought about is representing different actions. So if you took something like uh, D-Day and you focused on the different beaches and each of them had their own kind of game channel and then each player could, you could experience all of those different ones or you could do them all at once together. So I think just expanding on it in that way, th th there's a lot of flexibility. So um, legacy games like Legacy Pandemic that build on previous iterations or, or, or plays of the game are increasingly popular. And I really like your notion of like a legacy small game where you build on the previous play to you know, start a new portion of the storytelling element, whether it be the evacuation or another beach or another beach. And I think that's where your card components have a really interesting element of allowing you to do that without changing the fundamental map because it's so flexible. Yeah. Um, so if you ever do it, obviously we're interested in playing it. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so the next question is, we talked a, a little bit about your game, uh, design exercises or your failed game designs, uh, in your mm -hmm. previous slides. Um, yeah. can you give us an example of one or two that, uh, why they failed and what you learned from each of those experiences in those, in those design exercises? I've been trying for... So I love Dune, one of my favorite books, one of my favorite stories. I absolutely love it. And it's the thing that I kind of default to if I have a design idea that I want to test out. Um, and I've been wanting to create a Dune game forever. I, like a long time, not that long. Like I, I, I went through a phase where I did Hex Encounter, like super small map Hex Encounter games. I did one on Agincourt. I actually did a Fremen Harkonnen War game. Um, but I try to kind of blow those up uh, and I keep kind of getting stuck in blowing those up. Uh, I, I, I inevitably run into problems with the way that the map sets up. I think the limitation I've given myself is, okay, 10 cards is a map, tell a story. Like, 
how do you represent this space or how do you represent the uh, the flux and the changes that happen here. So normally that's what happens with this is the, it's the uh, component restraint I've given myself that ends up being kind of the death knell to some of the designs, especially with those Dune ones. Uh, for historical ones, the, the vampires game that I showed earlier, uh, I, had, I had done a game a while ago, uh, like very small, not a ton of testing on it. It was more like an exercise on this uh, like Maoist revolution in the Araguaia in Brazil in the 70s, uh, where I tried to test out some things kind of like coin, like coin adjacent uh, that kind of got stuck when I hit that. Uh, and it, it's frustrating. And then that's kind of the question you ask yourself, are those limitations because you... Like, are those the limitations of the designer themselves, or are they uh, because of the components? And I think that I constantly look at my design and think, how can I become better at this, and how can I work through it? So those are some examples, but I, I really try to, I try to celebrate the fact that I make mistakes in, in everything, um, and then learn from the mistakes, because if you never make the mistake, uh, you're never going to have the opportunity to, uh, like, fix whatever that mistake is. So Dune is uh, a series close and dear to my heart, um, and we'll talk offline about the upcoming movie. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> but uh, so to continue on with some one of my own questions is, so I teach a wargaming design course, and one of the things I try to teach my students early in the week or early in the semester is how to wrap their brains around translating the history to the game mechanic or the, the game system. And that's usually the first big hurdle they, they encounter because they, they're all students, they all understand how to write papers and do research and yeah. read primary sources, but then trying to convert that narrative, that story, those dynamics into a, a workable game system um, is often their first real big hurdle. So what, mm -hmm. what are some of your tips at, and tips and insights in overcoming that first step? So the first step is a connection, finding a way to connect to the history, um, whether it's our shared humanity, uh, whether there's a, a certain aspect of that history, particularly that you're drawn to, uh, finding that bit and then focusing on that and having that be kind of your guiding light throughout the process. So let's say uh, like you're, you're told to work on and do this project and there's a specific history you've chosen and you're feeling stuck in how you communicate and tell this story. If you focus on that element, so like for me with Gallipoli, uh, focusing on Anzac Cove, specifically on like the soldiers landing on the beach, running up the hills, not knowing what they were going to encounter, like that little bit of humanity that I've never experienced that, but I've experienced fear and I can connect to that idea of this deep fear that they had because I've, I've, I've felt fear before, not to that degree, but I've felt it, like channeling those emotions and then drawing those emotions in and then saying, well, how does that make me feel and how do, I, how do I represent that? I think the other thing too is through conversations, that if you really feel stuck, find somebody who has a better understanding of it than you do. I think one of the awesome things about being at school is the there are so many people around you who are all focused and fascinated on different things. Just talk to them, finding out their connection to things, their understanding, kind of learning from them, that kind of empathy um, can really help drive you and connect to it. And then once you've connected to whatever bit of that history you want to tell, you hold on to it. It feels sometimes like you're riding a bull, like you find it, you get on and, and you don't let go and that you're gonna be tossed around and other ideas are gonna come up and things are gonna happen. You can find ways to add them, but like once you have that guiding light, focus on that until it gets to a point where either you find a better guiding light or um, you're done. So to a uh, follow-up question is, how do you assess during the play testing phase of, of a game design, whether you're creating the engagement that you want in the game? So you know, what, are there certain metrics you use or is it sort of like a gut feeling? My biggest one is around uh, if I lose 
So if I'm playing a game that I designed and I'm losing, that's a good sign for me. That, that means that like I'm making it hard, like that I'm telling the story right, that I'm, I'm challenging myself. And if I challenge myself uh, and create that puzzle there, I feel like it'll be challenging for others. Um, and then also around uh, play testing, I love blind play testing. Uh, I, I do a lot of solo design, but also like some two player design and just kind of putting it out there and sharing it with people. One of the things I really love is on, on Twitter or on Board Game Geek, put something out there and then there's a really awesome community of people who play these games and then give really excellent feedback. And then if somebody gets how to play a game through the rules that I've set out and their experiences is kind of what I've experienced through it, then I take that and I say, okay, this is good. We're on the right track. Like we can keep moving this way. So I find that personally for me, if I find my design challenging and then if I'm getting good blind uh, feedback. So on that note, um, a lot of these sort of you know, tips and insights we discussed in your in your presentation is it's great for small games, but not only for small games and can be applied to larger traditional games. So the question is, do you find having the discipline to build a small game helps you with larger game designs? If so, how? I, it, it makes it harder for me, actually. I get nervous, I think. I'm a very self-conscious person <laughs> in that I... Uh, Working within a set of constraints is, is good for me. When I push myself out to more, I kind of feel like I'm lost at sea a bit. Um, I think that's just me. I know a lot of people where it's much easier to design really big and then it's harder to cut down. It, it, I, I don't know why I think the way I do. It's just the way my brain works. Um, but I definitely think there are benefits in that what you realize is that a lot of the larger games you play, a lot of the really good large games are, of a bunch of small games within so like you can take so like there's this really great coin discord server and on this coin discord server there's somebody who has taken the uh, game uh, the fire fire in the sky I, I, I might be saying that wrong I'm, I'm sorry if I am. Um, but they took it and the the coin game they took it and then they said all right we're just going to focus on this one thing that happened right around Hanoi. And it's just this area of the board. So essentially they took the game and they shrunk it down to this. And it shows you that these large games are built up of small components, but they're all strung together to tell one story. So I think that I would suggest it if you're stepping in into game design, focus on a smaller design first so that you can kind of understand these things, but then realize that most large designs are just a collection of smaller stories that are all told together. So um, the game you're referencing is Fire in the Lake, which is part of the Corn series. By Thank GMT. you. Yeah. I was missing um, that in uh, Falling Sky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is also a great game by Volker Um Yeah. So actually what you sort of talked about is something that I tell my students all the time where you build uh, small, you focus on a singular dynamic or relationship, and then you build up and out, right? Because if you think about, if you try to think about too much in your game, often you get lost in the weeds, you don't know where to start. And I tell them, just start something small. If you're focusing on artillery, just focus on that singular action of how do I fire on a target? Or if you're focusing on ships, how do ships engage one-on-one -on -one and then sort of build out to two, three, and, and so forth, and other factors that may um, affect it. And often it is it's a good way to you know, sort of build, like you said, the small series of models and uh, game system mechanics and then meshing them together as you go. Um, mm -hmm. So as I wait for a last call for questions, um, is there anything that you learned that from designing the landing that you're gonna apply to the, your next small game design? Yes, um, I actually took the, uh, the, the elements of the landing that Tim and uh, Tim and Aiden and I from Catastrophe Games kind of created, and I used that to make a game called uh, Kettle Hill, which is about the attack 
during the Spanish-American War, Teddy Roosevelt and the, uh, the Rough Riders and the, the Buffalo Soldiers and the attack on the San Juan Heights. And I kind of took what I learned from that and added it and, and told a different story after I read this really great book called The Crowded Hour. Um, uh, and I was just kind of driven uh, to, to do something with it because I had had it and I'm like, oh, like I said with the toolbox, you create your toolbox and you can kind of tell these stories. Um, and that game should be coming out sometime next year. It's in development between Tim and Aiden and I. But yeah, I plan on taking a lot of it and then doing more of this. I, I love this. I, I love finding these compelling stories and telling them. And, and the thing that I would love is for more people to do it. I've, I've been, I feel so the thing that makes me happiest is there have been two people who reached out to me who based on this type of design have created their own designs. There's this one really cool uh, Vietnam game that somebody designed based off of Kettle Hill. And then there's a, the Hoth game I just did. Somebody did an Endor, a uh, Battle of Endor design, which is really cool, which I, I'm, uh, I'm working with them to help them kind of figure out the bits uh, for it. But it's just, I love that. I, I, I design games because I, I love them and I love this community and I love sharing with them. And I love that people, the, the more people that are a part of this community, the, the better we all are. So thank you, Joe. So one of the reasons we had you on this year uh, for this webinar is because you're in game design to keep it simple and elegant and dynamic all at the same time is incredibly difficult, right? Simple designs are often harder than adding a lot of components to it to distill something down to its essence. Um, so we really appreciate your talk. And one of the new things we're gonna do for this year and, and uh, to end each of our webinars is to ask our presenter um, the question of, if there is one war game or game that you wish um, someone developed, what would it be on anything? Oh, that's a great question. I already know what it is. I would love to see more games, not just one game, many, many games about the Haitian Revolution. It, it's, it's, in, it's an incredible topic. There's so many great historians focused on it. There's so many compelling stories within it. Like just talking about the like Leclerc's expedition in 1801, uh, and then the British invasion earlier, and then the start of the revolution and the War of Knives, there's so much in there and there's no games on that. Just like, it doesn't have to be a big game about the Haitian Revolution. It just has to be games about those. Like we have so many about all these incredible set battles uh, throughout history. I wanna see more Haitian Revolution games. And if anybody has questions or wants to talk about it, I can put you in contact with the right people. I can show you the right Twitter handles for the historians to follow that you can talk to, the books that you wanna read. but we need more, we need to tell this story more because it's so vitally important that people realize uh, the incredible sacrifice that was made during the Haitian Revolution and the, just kind of the, the, the just how incredible of a, of, of a story and how important it should be to our history. Well, thank you, Joe. Uh, and thank you everyone <clears throat> for joining us for the first webinar of the 2021 uh, calendar year and we have many more uh, webinars up ahead for those next week we will have um, actually one second I believe we have Mike Linick from RAND talking about the um, RSG games and then after that we have Caitlin Jamison from NDU National Defense University talking about distributive gaming so thank you everyone for joining us and have a good night